The reassurance comes not a moment too soon. If God is alive and well on Highway 59, this must be the right road. When God had created heaven and earth, as we've heard, he then produced the state of Texas, and in it, Houston, this rich place with its feet buried in the oil below and its hands now groping among the stars. What sort of a place should a space city be, I wonder? That is what we've come to find out. Behind the gate lies NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Where else but in Texas would men set up to administer space? Even in a country of superlatives, this is a bit much to take. It's the vehicle assembly building called the VAB, or Apollo's Garage. It's seriously claimed to be the biggest building by volume in the world. It's where they assemble the vehicle and its parent tower and the mobile launching platform until the whole lot is carted away by a crawler to the launching site three miles up the road. Meanwhile, the whole paraphernalia lives in this monstrous place. You could put all St. Paul's Cathedral inside it with still room to spare. It is part of our time and I suppose our needs that the biggest building in the world should be not a cathedral, nor even surprisingly, a lunatic asylum, but the labor ward of an engine to put a man on the moon. In this headquarters of mechanical mystery, there's a place enigmatically called the real-time computer complex, which is inhabited by the real technocrats, the metal mines without which, it seems, there are no solutions, the computers already now so intricate they can be understood only by their own kind. This is the dominion of the computers. This is software. In this curious world, the actual think tank is called the hardware because the stuff is made of steel. This is the software because it's made of people, the special people who are the halfway stage between men and machines. Literally, actually so. They are the middlemen between the human requirements of this wild place and the boxes that give the answers. These people, you see, can ask the questions. They know the words, the symbols, the arcane jargon these things understand and to which they respond. These software here, they can translate what has to be done into the creepy conversation of the computer. When the day comes that they don't need software, they won't need anyone. What a piece of work is software. What an impertinence. Meanwhile, this hallowed hardware bides its time, growing and multiplying in its twittering, transistorized infallibility. There's an awful brainless certainty about these things that know everything and understand nothing or not so far. These are the things that the astronauts find reassuring, all protective. To me, they are a sort of nightmare. If you can imagine anything more preposterous than me in a Apollo spacecraft, I can't. <laughs> the antics they make one get up to. It is like it is like being enclosed in a sort of demented telephone box with two other men for probably a couple of weeks. Out of the question, I assure you. In front of me, or rather on top of me, is a bank of uncountable and equally incomprehensible switches and dials and compasses and indicators of one kind and another. I can't even read the language they're written in. Oh, yes, I can. There's a the abort button of which they spoke so much. Then there's, oh yes, there's the master alarm. I think I'd have my finger on that little titty for the entire run of the trip. <laughs> no, I don't think I have the makings of an astronaut. The true motive power is conquest. This 
charting of the firmament is history's great contemporary joust, where men are making holes in the sky in which to plant a flag. We have you go for orbit here, go for orbit. So man escapes the playpen of the earth and lives his fragile hour swimming in emptiness before the cameras. That's a difference. We say these explorers are in line with Magellan and Columbus, but to the old adventurers, everything over the horizon was mystery. They didn't know their destination. They didn't even know if they had a destination. Now man at least knows the way and has the means. We say man, but do we really mean just man? Does it matter who is the first man on the moon? You bet it does. This is the end product of the mechanical revolution in its very primitive sense, of course, because the more advanced a machine is, the easier it seems to be to dispose of it. When you've finished with a billion dollar Saturn rocket. It's quite easy, you just lose it in space. It's less easy here below when you've got something that won't go anymore, nothing left to sell. I wonder whether one day there'll be a bit of the moon that looks exactly like this, with all the bits of lunar modules that nobody wants anymore. Sooner or later, we muck up everything we've been to such trouble to create. It is surely the genius of our species to invent our own anarchy, our own self-cruelty, expensively and earnestly to torment our environment into exquisite inelegance. And then, when things become insupportable, to shout for the scientists or call for the cops. You know, you know who did it, John? Not like that. No. Do, do you know the people? Were they friends of yours? Have you ever seen him before? I wasn't hurt. You weren't hurt. Now, how did you, how did you get that? They did. They hit you with a bottle? With their feet? With their fists? Or what? I don't know. So they take him away. He'll never get to the moon. I don't suppose he'll ever get anywhere. We've lost him now. Everybody's lost him now. Once upon a time, the world was a realm of unanswered questions, and there was room in it for poetry. Man stood below the sky, and he asked why, and his question was beautiful. The new world will be a place of answers and no questions, because the only questions left will be answered by computers, because only computers will know what to ask. Perhaps that is the way it has to be.